So this is who I am. You guys have all met me. Thank you for inviting me and allowing me to share your dinner and letting me share my children with you. Um, so I work at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Law School at Whitefield Law. Um, and I I should say that that I, when I started looking at uh, the Peace Tax Funds Bill, I wasn't necessarily looking at it from a perspective of uh, this is amazing, I want to save this bill. How do we make this, this paper sort of came about? Uh, interestingly enough, I was at Pendle Hill, which is a Quaker um, center in Philadelphia, and I'm here for that, I guess. I texted a friend of mine who's also a, a professor and said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I wish that I could just think about this stuff all the time. And he said, did you see the call for proposals from the law and religion section? I said, no, what is it? And uh, they were looking for papers dealing with um, complicity. So people who are, uh, are required to do something that they feel violates their conscience. And I thought, well, that's, that's, a really, that's a really interesting topic. I had nothing to say about it. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that very much. Um, and I sort of thought about it and sat with it. And uh, the day that the uh, proposal was due, it came to me that I wanted to write about more tax resistance. Um, and so I created a proposal and I sent it in and I was absolutely sure that it was not gonna get picked. So I was like, well, really glad that I wrote that. Uh, I'm more familiar now with the sorts of calls for proposals that come from the law and religion section. It's a really great experience. And then they called me and said, okay, so we'd like to publish your paper and we want you to speak at the American Association of Law Schools and about how long do you think it would be? And I hadn't started yet, right? Because I was in church. Like, oh. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Um, all right. So I started my research. And when I started, I thought that what I was going to be able to do was to craft an argument that um, more tax resistance should be protected under already existing law. That was my hypothesis. Um, I had the opportunity to talk with Peter Goldberger, who kind of said, yeah, good luck. I've been trying that for quite a while. Best of hope that works out for you, Jen. Um, and I was still very optimistic because I thought, well, you know, yes, but I am not actually out there representing actual people. I get to kind of look at this from the idealized perspective of, well, yes, the judges have interpreted the law this way, but they were wrong. They should have interpreted it this other way, right? Um, as I got further into it, I thought, well, actually, I'm not really sure I can craft that argument, um, which is when I came across the Peace Tax Fund um, and the information related to it. So when I looked at that, then my question became, okay, so you've got this bill that actually would accomplish this. Why is it not passing? What's the, what's the deal with it? Why is it not passing? And as I looked at it, it just sort of happened that the confluence of events uh, has led me to believe that we're, we're at a moment right now where religious freedom seems to be something that interests the American public as a whole, right? So when you look at somebody like Kim Davis, the uh, clerk in Kentucky who refused to issue marriage license, who, who, who requires this like level of notoriety because supposedly, because she is doing something that she feels her conscience requires. And you look at the fact that um, there's a huge portion of the American populace who says, you know, maybe I don't necessarily agree with her, but I understand where she's coming from. I understand that that's something that she feels her religion requires of her. All of a sudden, it's kind of pushing to the forefront again, these issues of conscience and these issues of like folks who refuse to do things because they believe that to do so would make them complicit in what they consider to be sinful. When I first started looking, like I said, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can craft this argument that it's the First Amendment. It's the First Amendment that protects war tax resistance for religious reasons and um, would allow would allow protection. Um, and I should say that, that I'm, when I'm writing about this and I'm, and I'm working with this, I am thinking almost exclusively about this from the perspective of religious freedom. And I know there's other kinds of war tax resistance. Sorry, that's not my research area. What you want to know, the First Amendment says two things. The first thing it does is it protects the free exercise of religion. So you get to do the things that your religion requires of you. And you get to not do the things that your requires that you not do. Your religion requires that you not. And it also uh, prohibits the establishment of a government religion. And courts have interpreted that to mean that you can't favor one religion over another, and you can't favor religion over non-religion. So my initial premise was, well, maybe there's something in that free exercise, right? Maybe there's something about the way free exercise is defined or used that would allow us to say, hey, you are burdening my free exercise of religion when you require me to pay tax in contradiction of my religious beliefs. What the courts have said 
is that yes, you do have the right to free exercise. You have the right to do the things that your religion requires of you, and you have the right not to do the things that your religion um, requires that you not do. However, that is balanced against the state compelling interest. And when we talk about a state's interest in something, compelling is kind of the highest level. Next button, Elizabeth. And that makes sense, right? So if you're Abraham and Isaac living in the United States in 2015, and your religion is telling you you need to sacrifice your children to God, the state gets to come in and say, no, I'm sorry. We understand that that's your religion, and we understand that we're burdening your free exercise of religion, but our compelling interest in protecting the lives of our citizens means you don't get to exercise that part of your religion. You can and, believe and besides, it. only the state gets to sacrifice your religion. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 our territory. So, so, so that sort of makes sense. And so when these, these free exercise cases come in, it's a balancing test, right? If you would go where the court is looking at, okay, how burdened is the exercise of religion versus how compelling is the state's interest? So where it's something like, you know, don't sacrifice your kids, pretty compelling interest, you know, other things might be slightly less. If you will go forward, too. So I got about that far and um, started looking at some, some other, okay, what are other avenues that I could look at to try and get protection for war tax resistance through looking at the First Amendment? And so one thing that you find is that there's actually, I started kind of looking at conscientious objectors. And one thing that you find is that there's this long history of protection for conscientious objectors. So actually, at the time that they were drafting the Second Amendment, the Right to Bear Arms Amendment, there's this huge discussion about you have the right to bear arms, but you also have the right not to be forced to bear arms. That takes place during the drafting of that Second Amendment. So, so at that moment, our founding fathers are thinking about how do we protect conscientious objectors. What's interesting is that the conscientious objectors are getting protections not through the First Amendment. They're getting protections because Congress has traditionally passed some kind of a rule that says military, you're, you need to make provision for conscientious objectors. Where the First Amendment that comes in, because I'm standing in front of the light. Um, <laughs> probably if I moved over here, then it wouldn't be, but then the light's right now. So uh, conscientious objectors, yeah, Congress is making provision for that. The First Amendment comes into play when conscientious objectors of, say, a certain stripe are receiving protection, but others aren't. Or where Congress has said, yes, conscientious objectors get protection, and the question is, how much protection? Right? At what point are we actually burdening free exercise? Um, so Hobby Lobby is another one where uh, Congress had made a special exception for religious organizations. Congress, Congress passes a special provision for faith-based organizations, exempting them from the ACA. Hobby Lobby goes to the Supreme Court. It's only an issue about the First Amendment in the sense of what is a religious organization, right? The provision that gives them that exemption has already been created by Congress. Similarly, um, self, interestingly enough, self-employed Amish people have an exemption in the tax code. Uh, because Congress has specifically said, look, you guys don't have to worry about trying to go through the First Amendment to prove that the tax code unduly burdens you. We'll make a special provision for you. So I kind of look at those things, and then I say, okay, I need to, I need to think more about free exercise. Like, what does that mean? And what is this, like, free exercise versus compelling? How have courts looked at that? So one of the cases that, that I looked at is Sherbert. And the Sherbert test was sort of the rule for about 30 years. And Sherbert said... Um, that you, you can practice your religion freely, and the only time the state can burden it is when there is a compelling interest, and the only way to protect that interest is whatever the rule is that Congress has enacted, right? So you have this compelling interest, and the way that you've chosen to further the interest is the only way to do that. Next slide, please. Then Smith comes along. And pretty much everybody gets up in arms about Smith. So Smith is Native Americans who are smoking peyote as part of their religious ceremony. And the state comes in and says, hey, wait a minute. Smoking peyote is against the law. You can't smoke peyote. 
And the Native Americans say, um, excuse me, we've been, we've been living here since before your law. We've been smoking peyote since before your law. And, you know, this is our religion. You're burdening our religion. And the United States Supreme Court considers this case and tweaks what has been the law of the land. And they say, look, here's the deal. You, the state is not burdening your religion unless they're targeting you. So if it's a law of sort of general applicability, it applies to everybody, it's not a problem. So sorry, Native Americans who wish to smoke peyote, because nobody can smoke peyote, you have not suffered uh, an injury under the First Amendment that we're going we're gonna to compensate. So you guys are all giving me the look that everybody has when they hear about this case because it's ridiculous. Next slide. Congress thought so too. So Congress passes RIFRA. And what Congress is trying to do with RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, what they're trying to do is to say, let's go back to the Sherbert test. And let's say that you only get to burden someone's religion when it's compelling and strictly necessary. And they go this extra step, and they say, which is what I think is kind of important for war tax resistors. They say it has to be more than something that's routine or more than something that makes the government more efficient, right? That the mere, the compelling interest that the government has in creating a burden on religion has to be more than just it's more efficient for us to do it this way. Next slide. Then. So uh, the issue of RIFRA comes before the United States Supreme Court, the uh, United States Supreme Court says RIFRA is unconstitutional as applied to the states because you have Congress trying to make a law uh, about um, uh, what, right, right, right. It's, that, that, is, that is an issue that is not given to Congress to do. That is an issue that, that you know, Congress can make rules that regulate the federal government. They can't make, regulate rules that or I'm sorry, they can't create rules that regulate state government. So then Hobby Lobby comes in and they say, doesn't say a whole lot about uh, doesn't say a whole lot about RIFRA, but what one one thing we were kind of hoping would happen from Hobby Lobby is that we would really clearly go back to that Sherbert test. Because the idea was that Sherbert maybe provided greater protections. Um, but when Hobby Lobby comes down, what they say Pretty, this, is, this is what they say. Uh, it, whatever RIFRA is, it isn't limited to the pre-Smith definitions of, of um, free exercise. So Hobby Lobby basically says RIFRA is not taking us back to this Sherbert compelling interest test. Next slide. Um, okay, so all that's really interesting. What about more tax specific? So there are some, some important cases. One is Lee. Lee is decided in 1982. This is the case with the Amish um, farmers. And basically, basically the Amish uh, farmers are saying, social security tax violates our religious beliefs. So um, they come before the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court says, you know, yes, your religious beliefs are being burdened. So you think, hey, slam dunk, the Amish get to be exempt from social security tax. But no, because remember, you can burden if there's a compelling interest. All right, what could possibly be the compelling interest in the uniform taxation of social security? That's what the court says it is. The court says the compelling state interest in taxation is, it's gotta be simple, it's gotta be uniform, it's gotta be easy to administer. Um, Interestingly, Stevens, so, so it's uh, this plurality opinion, but Stevens comes in and says, you know, I'm concurring only in the judgments because he says the problem isn't that um, the exemption is there. The problem isn't the lack of uniformity. The problem is there's no currently existing alternate system, and you're asking the courts to create it. So basically, Stevens is saying to Lee and, and I guess the other Amish folks, Go to Congress, get your exemption. Then we'd be happy to find that you are protected under, under the first week. Next slide. So then Hernandez comes in, and under Hernandez, they talk a little bit more about Lee. And what they talk about is this idea that um, there's this broad public interest in maintaining a sound taxism, tax system, free of myriad exceptions 
flowing from a wide variety of religious beliefs. So again, this concern that you see with, you know, are we going to have, is this going to be a sliding slope? You give a religious exception to one person, all of a sudden the tax code has become, you know, basically self-created exceptions for everybody. Next slide, Adams. So Adams. Now Adams doesn't go all the way to the United States Supreme Court. It stops at the Third Circuit. So you've got the district court level, then you've got the appellate level, then you've got the Supreme Court level. What that means is that Adams is the rule of law for folks in the Third Circuit, but not necessarily for the rest of the country. Although um, many other circuits have followed what the Third Circuit did here. And what the, Adams was a war, or I presume she still is, a war tax resistor. Right? She, that's, that's who she was. So she's not an honest self-employed farmer who finds Social Security to be a problem. She's a, she's a war tax resistor. Um, Priscilla Adams. Yes, exactly. Oh, you guys probably know her. Yeah, yeah of course you do. Okay. So she, her argument is kind of, hey, and notice what's happened in the interim, right? RIFRA got passed. So she says, hey, Congress, you just passed this rule that's supposed to give greater protection to people of faith who are being forced to do something they don't want to do. Um, the court doesn't buy it. And the court kind of goes back to Stevens' dissent and Lee and says, look, we are definitely burdening your free exercise religion. But we have a compelling interest in doing so. Our compelling interest is in this uniform system of taxation. So if Congress wants an exemption for people of religious faith, Congress should create an exemption. Knock yourselves out, Congress. Don't ask us in the courts to do that. Next slide, Adam. Um, so then Hobby Lobby comes down, right? And this is the question that I've heard from a lot of war tax resistors. And I have to say, if I, you know, was was... If I had to craft an argument, Hobby Lobby is exactly where I would go, because I think it's probably the strongest argument that there is under existing law. And Hobby Lobby, um, the problem for me, from my perspective with Hobby Lobby, is that they took a rule of uniform applicability, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. There already was a religious exemption. When Congress passed the ACA, it had a religious exemption. So if you were a faith-based or faith -based organization, you didn't have to participate in certain parts of this law of uniform applicability. And Hobby Lobby interpreted what did that mean? Well, so apparently now for-profit corporations are people who can have religions and you know <laughs> this is this has been expanded. So um, right, so so the, the the problem I think from from our perspective is it doesn't really give us any more ammunition for arguing that there's that we have an exemption unless there actually is one that Congress has passed. Next slide, Atticus. Um, so I, th I think it's interesting to kind of look at, at the evolution of kind of how Congress and the courts are tossing this issue of religious freedom back and forth in, in the context of some what's happening, right? So we have Sherbert, and then we have Smith, and then we have Rifra, and then we have Hobby Lobby, and down here we have Lee, Hernandez, Adams, and so on. Um, and you can kind of see, like back when Sherbert was happening, Lee, um, and I should say, Congress actually responded to the ruling in Lee by creating an exemption for self-employed Amish folks uh, where they're exempt from Social Security tax. So um, Congress, you know, Congress wasn't, wasn't that point paying attention. And I think that this issue, you know, RIFRA in 1993 is a response to Smith. It's 19, go to the next slide, I guess. The last time that the uh, peace tax fund actually got traction in Congress, 1992, 1994, 1995, right around this RIFRA time, when all of a sudden religious freedom is a hot topic again. Next slide. And I think it's a hot topic right now. And I think I think this is a time that we can capitalize on. Why do I think it's a hot topic? Well, like I said earlier, we've got this whole Hobby Lobby thing. The fact that Congress passed a law of uniform applicability with these exemptions for uh, faith-based organizations, right? Um, I think many people were surprised. Many people saw that as a really interesting compromise. Why is Congress doing that? The fact that they were willing to shows they're interested in issues of conscience right now. Kim Davis, right, this county clerk in Kentucky, the fact that she's become this, you know, cause celebre around, you know, it shows that people are interested in issues of conscience. Same thing with this whole thing about Planned Parenthood, right, and should we defund Planned Parenthood? Again, you know, going back to issues around, um, Conscience. Next slide. So the last time that you know this was happening, 1993, 
And this is the time that RIFRA really gets hearings. There was an analysis of the bill in 1992, 1994. It came to uh, committee hearings in 1995, and then it dies in committee. What's frustrating from the congressional record, they don't say why, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, if I put on my, my cynical, my cynical hat, and I'm like, okay, what could possibly be their objection? Well, maybe it's about money, right? If I'm a congressperson, I don't want you necessarily cutting my funds. Well, the analysis done in 1992 and 1994 actually says the peace tax fund doesn't cut funds. So, okay, that can't be a problem. Um, in fact, they said there might be a slight increase in revenue. So, all right, that's that's not the issue. Maybe the issue is something about like a sliding a sliding slope or a slippery slope. If I didn't create this exception, there's going to be a million exceptions. Who the heck knows? We'll accept that Congress has done that, right? So, so what? How come it didn't move on? That was that was the question I was left to wrestle with. Next slide, I guess. Um, like, what do we do? I think the first thing we do is we change the name, and we make we make the purpose. It's not about peace. It's not about peace because not everybody is going to be on board with peace. But I think many people, or unfortunately, many people are going to be on board with the idea of religious freedom. I think the idea of religious freedom and the freedom from being forced to participate in war has a long history in the United States. I think you, I think that can be capitalized on. Um, I think that uh, making it about religious freedom makes it makes it more palatable. Um, I think making it really clear that we're not trying to tell Congress. Because, because one problem you run into is that the Constitution says Congress gets to gets the power in the first. Congress gets to decide, you know, what the tax is, where it goes, all this. So now all of a sudden we have citizen, we have citizen legislators running around creating their own tax system. No, Congress, no, you still get to take our money and decide where it goes. We're just saying this one place where it can't go. I think being really explicit about that. Um, Stevens' dissent says, hey, at least says. It's really difficult if we don't have an alternate tax. Like, there's no place for us to send this money. Hey, Peace Tax Fund can address that. Peace Tax Fund can say, this is where you should, should send it. Um, I think one of the things, and, and again, I'm, I'm looking at this and trying to think through, like, what are the, the potential objections? One objection could be something like, how do, we, how do we know that people are actually using this fund are the people who should be using this fund, right? Um, it's actually not that hard. We already have the system in place to determine whether or not somebody is a conscientious objector. The government's already using it. Uh, so I, as far as I'm concerned, we can just borrow from the same way the military determines who a conscientious objector is um, and use that. I think uh, the other thing to emphasize is that it's it's, a, it's an accommodation that Congress has granted. Right? Congress gets to grant this to its citizens to further the cause of um, religious freedom. right? And all of that being said, recognize that what I'm saying is I think there will be uh, effects of the bill that maybe maybe are not its selling points when, when you're sitting down with a number of your congressional legislators, you know, your congressional legislators that you know maybe, maybe you don't say like, hey, I think this actually would help to end war. You talk about your religious freedom and the fact that like you know you're a person of conscience who's been forced into this situation, um, but maybe it would have that effect. Next slide. Specifically, uh, I think there are, uh, I think there's, there's this argument, and this was something that came up when I was talking to law professors about this, is it's largely symbolic. And I think if I'm a congressperson, that's probably a selling point. Oh, so I can do this nice thing for you, and it won't actually cut my funding. Um, and of course, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, but I would like to end war. So actually, I would like this to cut your funding. Um, yes, that's a problem. That's a problem with the bill, because it doesn't do that. But if the purpose is instead to grant religious freedom, to say, look, you, rest of America, can do whatever you'd like to do with your funds, but I, my funds, are not going to war. The bill does accomplish that. And I think more if, if this were an option that were available to more people, you'd see more people signing up for it. And when it reaches that tipping point, that's where it stops being symbolic. Um, and I want to be really clear, I'm fine with it being symbolic, right? Like, all of religion is symbolic. We, as human beings, we like symbols. That's why we have Christmas, right? Um, so, so I'm fine with that. But I think there's a place when you get enough people on board that it stops being symbolic and it actually would have a practical effect. Um, 
all of that being said, those two things being said, one thing I would say, it's limited to religious objectors. So folks who are opposed to, for example, a specific war, not going to be covered by this bill. Um, now, maybe down the road, this would open up precedents where something else would, would allow them to be covered. But right now, somebody who, who is not a religious objector, not covered. What's a religious objector? Well, as I said, we're really fortunate if we borrow from this conscientious objector standard because the court has already told us what a religious objector is. A religious objector is someone who has a deeply felt, or sometimes they'll say sincerely held, belief in the moral and ethical impermissibility of all war. And the litmus test seems to be, are you opposed to all war? So if you would be okay with, say, a, some, some wars but not others, you're not a conscientious objector. But if you would be morally opposed to all war, you are a conscientious objector for religious purposes, you would be sheltered under this bill. So I know I've talked a lot. I'm sorry if I was still speaking quickly. I tried to slow down. Um, <laughs> but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Alex. What's the Fourth Amendment? The First Amendment is the amendment that says that uh, the government can't make you do stuff that's against your religion. How did you get interested in this in the first place? Yeah. How, it, from yeah. being a Quaker, is that what it is? Or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, so I, I knew Ward Hatch Resisters because of the Quaker connection. And um, I always sort of thought, well, you know, sort of idly thought, isn't it a sort of crying shame that courts haven't found there is an, an exception for Ward Hatch Resistance? And so when the opportunity to um, do this research came about, that, that was where I started. So, yeah. Yeah. In Mennonite circles, I uh, often run into the question of the fungibility of money. And they're saying, well, yes, you know, we didn't want to go to war uh, uh, personally, but uh, our money, well, that's different. Uh, how, do you, how do you address that? Uh, what's your sense of that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, so one thing I will say that I didn't really realize or or put together until I got in the middle of this was this idea of kind of there being a continuum of conscientious objection or a continuum of, of even war tax resistance, right? So, you know, you have, and the military itself recognizes this. So there are conscientious objectors who are qualified to serve in non-combatant positions, right? You can go and be a medic, you can go be a radio operator, you're a Hawkeye on NASH, all the way to like, no, you're, you absolutely refuse to participate at all. Um, and then the idea of sort of similarly for war tax resistance, right? That there's legal ways and not legal ways. I didn't really have any understanding of that, of those complexities or of those um, gradations. I think that the, the issue with and I think there are plenty of people who would say, I'm a pacifist, and I am fine with the fact that some of my money, my tax money, goes to fund war. Um, historically, that was, so in that discussion about the Second Amendment, that was something that came up, right? Where they said, well, maybe we won't make people bear arms, but we'll make them, we'll make them pay a certain amount of money to fund the military. And um, one of the representatives says, oh, you know those conscientious objectors. They're not going to pay. They won't go, and they won't pay. What are we going to do? Um, but so that idea of like, would they pay? And um, during the Civil War, same thing comes up. Congress says, hey, you know what we'll do? You can, if you, if you don't want to go to war, you can pay 300 bucks for somebody else to go to war for you. Tons of conscientious objectors, many conscientious objectors say, no, I'm not, I'm not paying the 300 bucks either. So Congress responds to that by um, redrafting that, that exception, ex exemption and saying, you could pay $300 for somebody else to go to war for you. You could pay $300 to hire a nurse at the army hospital, or you could come be a nurse yourself. Uh, so they, so I mean, they were trying to be responsive to that issue. So, you know, I think what I would say, one, one thing I would say to the idea of somebody who says, I don't want to go to war, but I'm not necessarily so upset about my money going to war. Um, I wonder how that person would feel if they had a legal way to keep their money out of war, right? I, I mean, it's, you don't know till it's there, but it, that would be an interesting question to pose to that person. Thank you. Um, we have a comment from online folks. Um, Anne says, 
one argument in uh, war tax resistance uh, law cases has been that the U.S. tax code must be kept uniform, simple, but it is not at all uniform or simple. We can prove that. So doesn't that negate the compelling interest argument for a uniform tax code? So do you want my personal opinion or do you want my... <laughs> uh, well, you should give... Uh, so, so I think, you know, person to person, I agree. I think that that would be a, an end. I think if I were representing somebody who was a war tax resistor and I had only current law, that's the argument that I would make. The reason that that argument hasn't been successful is that the court says in the places where it's not uniform, that's been Congress's choice. So we as courts accept this argument that it needs to be uniform. If it's not going to be uniform, it, the burden is on Congress to make it not uniform, which is why, from my perspective, if we want this exception, we've got to convince Congress to make it. There's um, another set of, well, this might be more food for thought. There's a lot of questions here. I'm just going to read the comment. Um, and yeah, um, Andy says, what about people of conscience who are not religious? Does removing the word peace um, really make the bill more palatable and risk losing what few supporters there are. There's a number of different questions here. Andy, maybe you can pick the one that... Well, let me, yeah. let me tackle those. Yeah. Two. So the first thing I would say is, I mean, yes, yes. The, the, the bill itself is aimed at people, who, people of conscience who say, like, it's, it's religious freedom. That's what the First Amendment is about. It's about religious freedom. That being said, I think that the way that um, the court has interpreted religion for purposes of conscience objection would make it open. To, I mean, if you have a moral objection to all war, you are a religious conscientious objector. That's kind of what the court has said. Um, you have to you have to believe in you know it, it has to that belief has to have the same importance to you as. Uh, religious beliefs to someone who is a ascribes maybe to a more traditional religious belief, but hey, if you believe that war is morally wrong, every war is morally wrong, that's sufficient. And then the second question was, would taking the word peace out of it make it more palatable and maybe um, at the same time uh, lose supporters? In terms of losing supporters, I don't know. I and mean, then you guys got to figure that out. Right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, would it make it more palatable? Maybe, because I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure that members of Congress necessarily are, are on board with the idea of we should have a fund that's specifically about creating peace, right? I think they would say, well, what about the Peace Corps? What about social services? What about these other things that we do? Don't we already fund that? But I think, especially right now, you could get some traction with, it's not necessarily about peace, it's about protecting people's religious freedom. Um, and, and I mean, I think that's an experiment, right? You got to try it and see if it actually works. Um, I guess I, for fairness to Andy, I should read the rest of his comment just so it's part of our discussion. Um, how, uh, let's see, um, how do we get the bill to actually decrease funding for war? Do these tweaks really improve the chances the current anti-government Republican-led House will consider this? Does the new bill create two classes of conscientious objectors to military taxation, those who use it and those who don't because it doesn't reduce spending for war? Uh, so the last question I think is yes. I mean, I think, I think the answer to the last question is yes. You would, you would have people who used it and people who didn't. But I think you have people right now who are pacifists and don't resist and people who are pacifists and do resist. And I think you have people who... Uh, owe tax and choose not to pay it, and you have people who choose to live the, below the uh, poverty line so as to avoid taxation. Like I think you already have different sla different flavors of of war tax resistors. Um, it doesn't. It, it wouldn't, at least at first, at least for some time, decrease funding for war. Uh, it's not. It wouldn't really. It, it wouldn't really have any effect except the symbolic one until you got enough people on board that funding was effective. And I suppose from my perspective, the reason that I would be, two reasons that I would be willing to live with that. One is, to me, the idea of folks who, who, are, who are people of conscience not being required to do something that they find sinful or that they find immoral is very, I mean, I think that's the right thing to do. That's, that's what we do. We're Americans. That's what we do, right? Uh, we hope. 
um, I, um, and I think second, the idea that I, I think if, if this option were available, you'd get more people on board with it. And I think that's that's when it reaches the tipping point, when there's some there's a critical mass where it begins to actually happen. Oh, about the broad construction of religion. Yeah. Uh, Bert Rosen was an atheist, and uh, he was an atheist after that broad construction, and they tried to get him for the at the time of the Korean War, but as an atheist, he said he couldn't go, and he went to jail as an atheist. Conscientious objector. I would probably I would probably have to look at it. Um, and I have to admit, I'm not familiar enough with the Rosen case to say. I, I, I don't know if we ever get to the court. Was the Korean War was before that. Well, I, I, I guess they were. Yeah, after, good point. And I think he was in jail, though, after the broad, after the broad construction. So the broad construction comes around in the mid 70s. Okay, this was in maybe. Maybe. And yes, okay, and so prior to that construction, I, yeah, I see where you're going with this. Prior to that construction, you had to show that you were a member of an historic peace church. And so people who were, say, um, Seventh-day Adventists, who were conscientious objectors, might have difficulty establishing their conscientious objection because they didn't belong to an historic peace church. But as during that Vietnam War era, as more and more people began to file for conscientious objection, Conscientious, I'm getting excited again. Mm -hmm. Conscientious objector status, uh, the the court broadened that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so there were, um, I think it was 1971, maybe it was Gillette, maybe it was Welsh, uh, basically said, I don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. um, but the court said, if you have if you have this, this alternate moral system that mm -hmm. takes the place of religion, it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And one thing that I, you know, think is so difficult about it is that the military makes conscientious objection practically impossible these days. I mean, they don't tell people about it. People in the military have no idea. The chaplains don't even tell people in the military that they have an option to apply for conscientious objection. And the military is tending to dump people out and not even deal with the CO you know, not even allow them to go through the process. So asking the government to, you know, define who's a conscientious objector is almost shooting ourselves in the foot in the first place. So, I mean, it's, I guess my response to that would be they, they already are, right? They may not be using it, but they, they, have, they, have, they have a whole system for it. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if that's the route you choose to go, right, if you choose to say, because one route you could go would be, let's use the government's definition of conscientious objector. Or you could take that definition and you could say, here's all the ways it's flawed, and this is actually how you should determine what a conscientious objector is for the purposes of the Religious Freedom Fund. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would be an option. Um, but yeah, and, and I will say, even to that point, even when we've had really clearly delineated, this is what a conscientious objector is, you run in, you know, on the, the broad level, it's in the implementation of that problem, yeah. right? That's, uh, that's right. where the problem is. Yeah. And so, um, how how you fix that? I keep fighting, but <laughs> right, right, like yeah. yeah. yeah this is just a comment that uh, you didn't mention. It. There was it is a bill in Congress that we introduced several times. I think. Let me see, John Carter. I know it's the from Atlanta. No, John Lewis. John Lewis introduced the bill, and they changed the name. I think they changed the name. To get closer to the thing you said, that some people object to that. Maybe even some people in this room. They didn't want it to be, they didn't want it to be tied to religion. Mm -hmm. But uh, the only reason I bring it up now is because you know, I think. Yeah, no, I, I think I think we should run with it myself because I think it opens the door. If nothing else, it opens the door to a discussion. Yeah. About the words that resistance, but you can hear about even in, even a lot of these circles right now. I mean, look, even if even if you guys decide this idea is bogus, I'm not and I'm not editing this bill. It's too much, you know, it's limited resources, unlimited needs, right? This is not a place for spending our resources. I would say um, this is a really good time to bring attention to this. 
you know, if I were if I were giving you advice, find yourself a Kim Davis. Find yourself a really sympathetic person who is who's willing to go on camera and talk about like this is what I'm doing and you know, you know. Mr. Ho. Hmm? Mr. Ho. Oh. I mean it's too bad. I mean it's too bad that Priscilla Adams publicity wasn't now. Because I think I think we get more traction with this. Yeah, I think. I don't know if I want to. Do you have an actual question? Um, there's a question about here. About here? Okay. Where's the back? <laughs> that way. Right. And the other one. We have a comment from Anne online. Um, Anne says, Ruth is right, the military is rapid, ramping up its efforts to stop soldiers from filing as objectors, but this process could be a way of driving the conversation forward at home. Um, all these people would have to be interviewed. So it depends on how you write the bill. <laughs> right? So I, I think, and some of that might be based on like you guys who are in the field, like what you think Congress would go for. Um, whether Congress would want that sort of tightened, like yes, we want actual interviews with actual people. Although here's the thing, the IRS is already interviewing people that they think are doing shifty things with their taxes. Like it's, it's not like it's a huge administrative burden on them to ask them to do a few more interviews. Um, or whether you want to rewrite it to say, no, you know, you just file your form, and that's enough due diligence. It shows that you have a deeply held belief, and then you're a conscientious objector for tax purposes. So. I'm, I'm just going to demure on the idea that it, it depends on how you write the bill, um, because, because what it really depends on when you're talking about Congress is what kind of uproar there is about something. You know, the, the, the reason why Hobby Lobby and Kim Davis and all those folks are making headway is because the, the people who support their particular issue, you know, <laughs> pro-life people, they've succeeded politically. They got they got the numbers and the uproar to get what they want. And and that's the thing that we don't have. And and so, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit better to deal with this issue now than it was a couple of years before all this happened. But the truth of the matter is, unless unless we as a movement find a way to get that kind of oomph behind our position, how we write the bill is immature. I think that's true. I think that's true. Well, if it doesn't interfere with funding for war, it's kind of irrelevant for our purpose. As National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. So, so I think I can see that argument, right? And I think again, that's that's something that I mean, y'all are here, so you gotta you gotta decide. No, you know, <laughs> you know, either if if your purpose is to end funding for war, a bill that allows exemptions for people who claim religious objection to war I mean, is unlikely to effectuate that purpose. If your purpose is to allow people who object to war on religious grounds, the freedom to object to war this bill would accomplish, would accomplish that purpose. So I think it's it's deciding that, and I, I'm not sure those things are mutually exclusive either, from my perspective, and I'm, and I'm coming at it from an outsider, but I'm not sure those things are mutually exclusive. That uh, you know, a policy of incrementalism, and in that we will do this first. And I, I do think if you get enough people on board, you get more traction for the idea of ending war overall. But, but you're right; it doesn't. It doesn't. That's not, it doesn't. It doesn't do that. Maybe I'm asking you to reiterate what you already said, but I'd appreciate it if you would say, you know, what do you see as the uh, uh, you know the the best option or the uh, you know what what do we need to do to get the bill passed? And I speak speak as a person involved with with the bill. Uh, what are what do you see from where or anyone in this room? Uh, if the bill is a good one, then what do we need to do to make it pass? So. 
So I'm going to give you the typical lawyer answer, okay? And you guys are going to go, oh, that Jen, she talks about it on the side of her mouth. Matt, um, I don't think you're going to get traction with the idea of this is a bill to further peace, or this is a bill that's going to, at least not right now, I don't think you're going to get Is that, that, when you say that, are you saying also that this, at the same time, you're saying this is a bill that will not end war? Right. That's what you're, that's what that's, you're that's saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is when you write, you know, what is the purpose of the bill, when you talk to your Congress people about what is the purpose of the bill, I don't think, and I, again, I could be wrong. I'm not there. I'm not the one talking, the ones talking to them. I think you would get more, let me, let me put it this way. I think you'll get more people on board with the idea of, listen, Congressman so-and-so, you don't have to agree with my religious beliefs, but I'm asking you to respect them. And from the founding of this country, people who have objected to war have been given dispensations for being forced to participate in them. So give us give us this, this exception. And to take the word peace out of the title of the bill would enhance that? Or I, I think so. And I think the, the precatory language in the beginning where you talk about what the purpose of the bill is, the and I've seen previous versions of the bill that talked about, I mean, sometimes really eloquently and movingly about the importance of peace and how they, these monies can be used to further peace and create, I, as beautiful as all of that is, and as much as I personally think, heck yes, we should be signing that bill, I don't know if you would get as far with that as you would with, this is about protecting the religious freedoms of American citizens who are being forced to violate their conscience by having to pay war, having to pay taxes, that allows, you know, makes them complicit in sin. I also think, you know, make yourself some strange bedfellows, right? <laughs> there, there, there are other people who are also looking for religious exemptions to generally applicable tax. So right now there's, there's folks talking about what do we do about federal money and abortion? Well, I don't know whether or not you guys want to like get on board with that, but let me tell you, if they get an exception, all of a sudden, you got you got you got precedent for your own exception. And that's essentially what happened. Hobby Lobby, they got the exception. So why why don't we get it? Yeah. Exactly. Well, especially since the Supreme Court did declare that that's a tax. Well, since we are a Catholic worker facility, <laughs> I don't think the I don't think you're ready to throw bricks at me for pointing out that. Taking a position like this is perfectly consistent with what, for example, the Pope is saying right now. I mean, he's taking a position, you know, against all his wars and this and that and the other. And so, you know, I'm sure we could find some allies, for example, with that tradition. We have millions of them. <laughs> There's a huge block of people in, in this country who are oppressive Catholics. Who what is that, what is pushed it? out by the left to make this. And what, and what is that spark that makes that happen? Is it, is it the Pope coming? Talk about that. Talk about the huge numbers of Catholics, Americans, who are progressives on every other every other issue you can think of, except this sex thing that everybody thinks is so important. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, gosh, you know, in terms of what is that spark? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if there's, I don't, I don't know, right? But I think that if you could mobilize your base to, to have this message of, I am a person who's being persecuted, I'm suffering, you know, this, this burden that we talk about on my free exercise of religion because of taxation. And sort of keep, the, you know, if that could be the, if, I think if enough people were writing to their congressperson and saying that, maybe, maybe that would help. I don't know. I don't know how well, you that, get there. That, that was, and, and probably still is, but that certainly was the kernel of the message that Mary and Franz used to cart around to Congress back back in that time you're talking about when they got they got a little bit of traction. Yeah, yeah. But it also depends on who the Congress person is. This is you're you're going to say, you know, something totally different to you know a liberal Congress person. Uh, who, who, you know, just thinks the government should have the ability to do what it wants to do versus somebody like my kind of person where, you know, I, I should go in and say, look, I'm a pro-life person and I don't support postnatal abortion. <laughs> that's the kind of language that would be appropriate for 
a lot of these guys right now. So. I mean, could you could you draw that parallel? Could you say like, look, in the same way that that you know, little sisters shouldn't be required to pay for uh, uh, birth control. I mean, would would your congressperson find that persuasive? Do you think? To make that analogy? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. Well, well, no, I mean, I don't know that they would find it persuasive because most of those guys are also extreme pro-militarists. <laughs> and they're going to gonna pretty quickly see where you're going with that. But they, they, might, they might at least find, you know, recognize the dissonance. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if you said, because, I mean, that's, and that's where the symbolic nature of it you know, like, it's not going to affect your military. You're, you may actually have a slight increase in total revenue for you know the United States of America. It's just going to let me not be a, be a participant in this action. I don't know. I don't know. So conscientious objection to the draft used to be based on purely religious exemptions, right? Mm -hmm. And then it got broadened mm -hmm. because a lot of people said, I don't believe in war and I'm not religious. And I believe that the government allowed the broadening of that definition. Why would we want the definition of uh, tax resistance as conscientious objection to go back to something narrow of just being a religious objection? Why wouldn't we want it also to be broader and include both religious and non-religious objections to paying taxes for the war? I see what you're, okay. Yeah. So, no so, so the legal the legal definition of religious conscientious objection is that broader definition. So that the broader definition is a deeply held uh, moral and ethical objection to all war. And from from the eyes of the court and the legislature, that deeply held ethical and moral objection to all war is religion. Okay. Even though the person who holds it might say, no, I am an atheist. I am a humanist. I am whatever. For the purposes of religion under the First Amendment and the heightened protection and respect that we give religious freedom under the First Amendment, that set of beliefs is religious in nature. Yeah. Yeah. An anarchist objection would be that it does tend to raise more money mm -hmm. for the state. Mm -hmm. I'm an I, anarchist. Okay. <laughs> um, I also know, so I know another thing that uh, Elizabeth Boardman had brought up was apparently there's a libertarian, so, somewhere in Rand Paul's book, he talks about anti-war tax or war tax resistance. I have not Ron, read the book. Ron, Ron Paul. Paul. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I haven't read the book. I'm not familiar with it. I have no idea. But apparently libertarians also have views about this, and that might be something to, to think about. We have, we have yeah, Rand Paul. Ron Paul's son is on our list of, of persons that we're contacting. Ah, okay. I just said that just a practical story here. Uh, a bit over a year ago, we were in the halls of Congress, and and they decided to do this. Is we we'd like to have a right now only to this point recently only representative signed uh, sponsored or co-sponsored yes. bill. Mm -hmm. Previously, there have been a few senators who have done that, and one of them was Senator Harkin from. Hmm. From uh, from Iowa, mm -hmm. and uh, we knew that he was retiring, but we went to visit him anyway because he had promised us earlier that he would support the bill if a Republican would. Okay. And uh, you know we were thinking maybe somebody you know uh, isn't Rand Paul a senator? Rand Paul's yeah. a senator. Yeah. Yeah. And and we thought maybe we could put them together, and you know we walked into Senator Harkin's office. And he was just, I, I, I have, in my experience of being in the halls of Congress, I have not, not seen a, a politician be so excited about meeting with us. <laughs> it was just, nice. it was just, it was just incredible. Now, maybe he knew that he was leaving Congress and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, he just kind of felt like, well, I can, I can do this now. But, but, you know, it was, it was, I think it was, I think he was saying, you guys are persistently at this. You've been at this for years, and you continue. Here you show up again in my office, and you're saying, you know, you're saying this thing. 
and that's just you, you just had the feeling that that he was he was affirming all these really good values that we're trying to to, to do with the bill and you know uh, uh, you know whatever 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 it comes to and and uh, and yet he didn't. You know, I thought maybe, maybe before he left office, he would just say, "Forget signing on a Republican. I'm signing on again, just on my own, just because I want to." But he didn't do it, and I don't know what that means. Um, I want to bring in a comment that was shared online from uh, David. He says, "No questions, but I still believe the peace tax fund bill would be harmful to the war tax resistance movement." Anyone who would pay into the peace tax fund would be paying for war just as much as any other taxpayer. If your religious ethical beliefs are merely symbolic, they aren't worth the damn. <laughs> Thus spoke grumpy old David. <laughs> what was that? Aren't worth a damn because what? That, that was his comment. That, that's as written. If your religious ethical beliefs aren't, are merely symbolic, they aren't worth the damn. Robert, a couple more, and then we'll wrap up. I'll just, uh, cl playing off of what Dave said there, I'll, I'll just share my concern about the Religious Freedom Peace Tax Fund Bill, and that is that that I, I think that it tends to provide people a, a way to do something that is less than what their conscience is really telling them they ought to do. And too many people make that compromise, and the result of that com making that compromise is that they're never going to get the bill passed. Um, con you know, con Congress did not approve conscience objection in the Selective Service System because people went to them and said, "Oh, it, it would be great if I didn't have to go in the military." They approved it because they had demonstrated that they were not going to go in the military. I mean, you know, when the Mennonites and, and, and those folks went to Congress in the 40s as, as World War II was about to happen, they were able to say, you don't want to repeat what happened in World War I. Uh, and Congress went along with that, partly because the military went along with that. They didn't want to be here. And so if, if we actually want this kind of bill, the only way we're going to get it is to demonstrate that we're not going to pay taxes for war irrespective of whether or not you pass the bill. Once we demonstrate that, they'll pass the bill because it's to their advantage to do so. That's a good thing. But, but, but short, short of promoting what we're about promoting, which is the actual non-payment of taxes for war, the bill isn't going to go anywhere. So we need a martyr. No, we need a few thousand. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, what Peter Peter spoke at our meeting a year ago, right, um, at Earlham, and in terms of Hobby Lobby and that kind of thing, it's true that we do need the IRS to go after somebody so that then there can be some kind of case um, and then, you know, some of these arguments could play out in court, but as long as the IRS is also going to ignore us, um, yeah, we need to strengthen our movement in, in order to get them to pay more attention in order to bring yeah. this stuff to the surface. But of course, the more the, if the movement gets bigger, the IRS comes down harder and then people drop out. So it's kind of this <laughs> cycle that we've been in, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you don't know how somebody like Ken Davis kind of comes out of nowhere and gets that sort of attention, except that there's a network that's ready to support somebody like that, and we don't quite have that yet. It might be there if the IRS went after somebody, um, mm -hmm. a wider network to support us. There are a lot of anti-war people out there, so it, you know, they might come out of the woodwork. But you know, how you, what that spark is, is hard to um, create. <laughs> I guess I would say so on and David and I have corresponded a little bit, I think, this but from from my perspective, I I think symbols that symbols have power. Symbols carry meaning. Symbols are 
sort of the essence of the human ex experience, right? Like that's that's what separates us. That's what makes us human beings is that we can embrace the power of something that is merely symbolic. Um, and I, I think there are very few things that are merely symbolic. I think the very act of doing a thing carries meaning and value uh, beyond the, the thing that is that act. So from my perspective, the fact that something is merely symbolic, you know, you could just drop the mirror because it's, it's symbolic and I'm okay with that. Whether whether that accomplishes the goal of the wider community, I think is something you guys have to, have to figure out. And I think in terms of, you when know, you had said, well, you know, it's hard because, you know, you don't really have somebody and then, you know, you have to have this wider network, but then when the IRS cracks down, then the wider network disappears. But if you had a network of people who were, let's just say partially conscientious objecting because they had to, to war because they had the, the religious freedom tax fund bill. Um, maybe you have this base, right? Like you have this base of folks who are at, at least dipping their toes, right? If, if we want to say that's not, that's not, you know, actually effective war tax resistance, at least they're, they're dipping their toes and maybe they, they go into to something more or something greater. Um, I don't know. Again, it's something good. Yeah. Have you gotten much reaction to your paper? Hardly any, actually. There was a time in the Vietnam War when there were more conscientious objectives than there were in depth. I think we could wrap this up, and um, people who haven't seen our paper, it is linked on our website. I think it's on the latest news page now. Um, you can search on our name probably in Peace Tax, Religious Freedom, and find it also online. And were there, I brought one copy. Were there a few copies? I brought the couple that I had left, but feel um, free to take them. It's also, okay. as, if you go to the uh, Social Science Research Network and just Google my name, Jennifer Carr, it'll come up. You can download it. Thank you, gentlemen. Right, 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 right. right.